two, one. Hi guys and welcome. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for joining me. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. I'm really looking forward to this session with you. That's amazing. So today we are chatting about dissections, um, equine dissections, and this is a subject that I'm extremely excited about diving into uh, because I actually love attending dissections and I miss them from my student days. So I'm really keen to be learning more about, um, yeah, about how they're done out in Mm, I'd, should I say outside of you know student days and why we should be attending them uh, when we're no longer students and when we're practicing in the field I think it's an, an incredibly important thing to do um, as part of our, our continuing education throughout our careers so if you guys are joining us live please say hi let us know where you're from and let us know what your interest in the subject is um, let us know if you've attended dissections or if you want to attend dissections in the future um, we'd love to hear from you guys this is a conversation so we're live here with you on social media so that you can ask your questions chat to Lindsay uh, get to know her and yeah have your questions answered so welcome everyone uh, Lindsay, will you please tell us a little bit about yourself and about how you got involved in dissections? Yeah, well, I suppose when you say dissections, are we talking about whole horse dissections or are we talking about hoof dissections? Because the hoof is where I started. That's where I started looking inside the foot because mm -hmm. only because I was called an adult returning to riding and my son was dating a girl who had horses and I went to the barn one day to drop him off and there were all these horses there and oh my gosh it was like it was like a religious conversion almost the smells and the noise and the you know at the back of my neck when they were sniffing the back of my neck oh my gosh it was wonderful so I decided I wanted to get a horse well fast forward I did get one and I wanted to go barefoot and I needed to learn to trim because every time he was trimmed, he was very sore and mm -hmm. I wasn't. And it meant I'd have two weeks riding and then two weeks he would be so sore, he couldn't do anything. So I thought I'll learn to trim. And in doing that, I needed to learn what was inside the foot. That's, that was really, I just wanted to know what all the components were. And so I got some cadaver feet, which are, dead horse's feet basically and looked at them on the inside I put I put them through my husband's bandsaw down in his in his uh, shed and yeah he wasn't really very happy about it <laughs> but I got some amazing images and I thought wow so I started videoing and I put them on social media on Facebook and so my page is called the study of equine hoof and that was really where I started and the whole the whole purpose of it was to share what I was doing, learn with me. And I've always said from day one, I'm not an expert. I mean, none of us will be an expert until the day we die. And even then we haven't learned everything, you know. So I always say, learn with me and let's investigate this together. And my Facebook page did really, really well. I think we're up to, gosh, 70,000 now. We're almost inching up to 70,000 people all around the globe. And that's just on the foot. Now, I then realized that, you know, you can't just look at the foot in isolation. You have to look at the whole horse. And this is what everyone was telling me. And I'm thinking, well, what do you mean the whole horse? It's only the foot I'm interested in. And they go, oh, no, no, because, you know, it could be shoulder, it could be hip, it could be back, it could be right. OK, so I need to look at the whole horse. So how do I do that? Well, maybe dissection might be the thing to do. And... I went to one, my first one was with Sharon May Davis, and this would have been about six or seven years ago. And I'll be honest with you, I was like, ooh, okay. Didn't quite, um, didn't quite push my buttons because it was all muscles. And to me, it was just red on red on red. And, and this, and it just didn't, it didn't go in and I didn't quite get it. And the thing I wanted to look at was the feet. And I kept looking at this cadaver on the table and all the body workers were oohing and ahhing about the muscles. And I was thinking, I just want to look inside those feet. Anyway, 
that's that's what really where I where my passion was. And then going on from that, I've started doing whole horse dissections. Done uh, did about five at home with donated horses. And now I actually provide a service. So I go to other people's places, facilities, and provide a two-day dissection for them, or they come to me and I can I do dissections at my place. And what that does is that that brings in much needed funding for my studies, which costs cost me a lot of money in all my expenses and also because I had to drop paid work in order to do this so you know I needed to try and get an income from it to make up for those two days a week that I was losing so that's really how I got into it and I'm addicted <laughs> I'm not surprised I'm not surprised I think it's I mean, it's it's such an incredible moment when you realize just how connected everything mm -hmm. is in the horse and that, you know, how it, the other structures in the body affect the hooves and how that relationship goes back and forth and how the hooves are affecting those structures in the body. It is just it's such a moment when we when we make that connection and we're like, oh, my gosh, this is so much bigger <laughs> than I can comprehend, honestly. Um, so for someone, Lindsay, who's never attended a dissection before, um, how does it work? Can you kind of describe yeah. the experience? Because I, I know. Yes. Yeah. OK, so th th let's talk about if, if you come to my facility to to, to, to watch a whole horse dissection. So when I say a, a facility, it's basically my home, which my husband has created me uh, an outdoor area with an undercover, purpose-built undercover area and drop down sides, clear sides, big concrete plinth. And we have a trolley that the horse goes on. So, and so it's all purpose-built for what I need, what my needs are. So, when you come to a whole horse dissection, the, the worst thing for people if they've never been to one is that, first of all, are they going to be able to stomach it? And is it going to be really bloody and gory? And is it going to, are they going to feel really yuck about it all? And what I say to people when they come, the first thing is, as I say that, try and pretend that what we're looking at is just a, a model. On the table so they'll walk around the corner they've done all this signing in they walk around the corner everything is the horse is completely covered is on the table completely covered so it's no shock you know no shocks we go in really slowly and i talk to them and say imagine if you're watching a film and you see people getting shot and all sorts of things and you go you know it's only a film because they don't normally get shot in real life and and i say try and use that analogy try and tell your brain that this isn't real this is all pretend and it's a very very good model and that works really well for people and they start telling their brain this isn't really real so that's the first thing the second thing is is we go i go in very slowly so when i've been to dissections before i've gone in i've, I've literally turned up and the horse is sort of almost the skin's off things are off bits are off and i thought Oh, I want to see it from as soon as that scalpel went in. I want to see it. I want to see how the skin came off. I want to see the fascia. I want to see it from the beginning. I didn't want to see it all dismantled because I don't get it. So for me, we I don't touch anything until the students are there. I don't even pick up a scalpel until they're there. And we go really slowly. And I start by taking the skin off very slowly from the spine area and I start to uncover the shoulder. And from that moment onwards, it's not bloody and it's not gory. There's no blood because I have ways of making sure there isn't any. It's really clean. There's no smell because I use a spray and I spray everything. So if you can spray it and stop the bacteria breaking down the uh, the tissue fluids, then you don't get smells at this stage. And so by that time of starting to peel back and starting to go into the journey, people start to relax 
and they look and they are so interested that they forget all about how they felt. Now, sometimes they might go, oh, I'm feeling a bit bad. Okay, just sit yourself down. If you can't cope, walk away from the area. Nobody is going to judge you. And I always say this is your weekend and you've got to do and protect yourself how you see fit, you know, mentally and, and that. And I think by doing that, it gives people permission if they do feel a bit yuck. And to be honest, I've not had that many to actually walk away or go and have a cup of tea or go and have a little cry or, you know, we've had a few tears at dissections and, and I cry. I cry over them because I, my heart breaks when I see things that I shouldn't be seeing in horses that are very young or... Yeah, it, it's it's quite confronting, really. And so I literally start by we remove the skin and then we see the horse with the skin removed. And just that on its own is really mind blowing. It's not like the pictures, you know, it's not like you see in books. It's not like anything like that. It's different. Every horse has their own like fingerprint. And then we start to look at certain things uh like the first thing i tend to do is to get the gut out because that's huge it's a huge job and it's also a real well factor for people because once once you start to go through the muscle layers and then i get my students to i say get your books out come on what's this muscle here look it's going this way or it's going that way and look how thick it is and and then they'll get their books out and go oh yes it's the um in external abdominal oblique and I go yes that's right and then we look at the nerves going into it and then we go down layer by layer by layer until we have a window to the gut and if I've been really clever it's literally a window and if I've if I haven't been very clever or I've been unlucky then the gut sometimes pushes up into my face <laughs> because it's like a big balloon <laughs> because the bacteria are are still eating away at the the fiber and producing gas farts and the horse obviously cannot pass gas and so it just builds up and builds up so you know you end up with this big balloon uh, but once we do get it out it's fascinating and i go from mouth to tail and we look at the food the way it goes all the way through and we talk about what happens we look inside the gut and we look at all the different the, the membranes within the gut and why it works like it does we look at the stomach which is always my biggest fascination to cut the stomach open and we can see the food in there and see the two the acidic layer and the non-acidic layer and then my most favorite part is if we find bot larvae do you get those in south africa or africa uh yes we do <laughs> we do okay so for why me, is that interesting i don't know <laughs> i don't know why i like these awful horrible things but i do so to open up my stomach and to see a load of bot larvae i'm going whoa and they're all going whoa <laughs> so, yeah it's you know i'm quite dramatic with it all, really but then we can talk about well look now we can see these let's see what sort of damage it's done and i sort of shush them away i show them all the little holes that the bot larvae have caused where their mouth parts have gone into the stomach lining and have created i call them volcanoes that's what they literally look like little volcanoes with all the holes at the top and each of those volcanoes, it, it, it's if the acid can get into it because the stomach is acidic at the bottom, then that's where you start to get ulcers because it's going to eat away and, it, and it's going straight into an area which is already compromised by the bot larvae. So I show folks that and we have a look for ulcers. They're always quite interesting to see ulcers. And um, we talk about how much food we should be giving our horses when I show them a stomach and it's really huge. And I say, you know, the stomachs are not really designed for these huge, great volumes. They're, they're, they're just a, we're not even a holding chamber. Food is, shouldn't be in there for very long before it goes off to the next stage. And 
if they have too much, as in meals, I mean, mm -hmm. as in hard feed, too much, it starts to trickle out of the stomach before it's actually ready. And then it causes our problems down the gut. So what I try to do is bring to the table everything I look at, I try and bring it back to, okay, so what does this mean for the horse? And what does that mean for you as an owner? What take home message can you get from this? And yeah, it's, it's quite a journey. Yeah. I mean, that sounds amazing. And I love, yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, for me, I'm just like you with the feet. I don't want to know anything about the gut. Just get that out of the way so we can look <laughs> At the musculoskeletal system, please. <laughs> That's how I did really feel. But um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm terrible. I know. I'm, I'm just like, I don't want to know about pharmacology and I don't want to know about the, you know, nutrition and the intestines. And mm -hmm. I just don't want to know. I, I always feel like there's limited space in my brain. I want to get to the good stuff, you know, and it's wrong. I'm telling you guys this because it's wrong. There's not limited space well, in my brain. And all the things. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just want to say welcome to um, a few more people that have joined us live. It's so great to have you with us. Uh, I have Lindsay Field and we're chatting about whole horse dissections um, or just dissections. But I don't think you can talk about, you know, dissection of just one area without considering the whole horse as well. Um, we're here to chat with you guys. So if you have any questions, anything you want to discuss, anything you want to know, please ask those questions and let's let's have a conversation. Uh, that's why we're here live on social so that we can chat with you. Okay, so I really love that. So Lindsay, are you mostly offering these dissections for owners or are they professionals that are attending? Well, when we say, yeah, I, I would say that it's probably about 60% owners. Okay. But the rest are made up from body workers. Body workers love these dissections because mm. they get to feel the horse when it's alive. If if, if that's something that I'm mm. that I'm doing, I always offer that because it might not be appropriate for the horse if he's in pain. I don't want him messed about with. But if we do that, then it gives them a chance to feel and then it gives them a chance to actually see what happens under the skin and body workers love the muscle upon muscle upon muscle which is not really my thing like the gut's not your thing well muscles are not mine and i know that i've got to read and learn all these names and i'm thinking oh my goodness it's just red upon red to me but you know i've, I've got to learn it and all i want to do is get the muscles off so i can get to the bones but you see the thing is is that in a whole horse dissection, to get to the bones, all you're really looking at is a load of red mush because unless it's cleaned up, like clean bones, you don't really see anything and you can't really appreciate it. So the next stage would be later on when I've processed the skeleton, a year later, for everyone to come back and then we look at the, the bones because they tell another story, a different story, or they collaborate with what you've seen. So say, for example, I had this lovely horse. He was called Andy and he was huge and he was a huge, great warm blood. And he got really sacroiliac type issues and he was he didn't want to be ridden. He was about 22. He was sold as a riding horse, but as soon as he went out to be ridden, he just wanted to go back. And the owner just knew he wasn't happy. And she finally gave him to me, donated him to me, his body to me for dissection. And prior to that, when I watched him, he was doing some really weird stuff. Like he was rubbing his back leg on my fence and my fence is made up of panels of wood and he's rubbing and rubbing and I'm thinking oh, that's a bit weird anyway when I finally opened him up and looked into his bone into his joints because you can look at joints at a dissection the hip joint was full of these little it was like marbles like whitish pearly like marbles full of them and it's some sort of 
it, it's like some sort of cancer or a metastatic thing and it, it, it produces all these little marbles within it, it's produces it within the joint spec joint of the hip and then when I processed the bones a year later when I got them out the bones just confirmed that same story some of these little nodules that I collected and I've got them in little bottles in my <laughs> in my other dissection room had actually turned to bone and they had attached into his hip so you can imagine he had his hip um, socket grounded on these things so yeah sometimes we, we get some amazing stories at the time but then also later we get much more information mm -hmm. really it needs to be more like soft tissue mm -hmm. until you get the knee and then you can start looking at bones and you can look at tendons mm -hmm. and, and um yeah that's a whole uh, another new story yeah. really a whole story i I, th I think that's, uh, I, yeah, for me, I think it's one of the massive things when we get to see that whatever this horse was showing, whatever they were doing, whatever behaviors they were offering didn't come out of nowhere. It's not, you know, horses misbehaving and being ridiculous and we should just work them through it. And uh, there's a reason. And it just, we, we ignore that so easily and we don't, even realize sometimes you know it's uh, that that part is hard that part is is hard um yeah. so we're we're obviously a platform that is providing continuing education to rehabilitation therapists around the world um and this this subject is important to me because i really believe that as professionals attending dissections should be a part of our continuing professional development I think that um that it's I think that it's really important so do you agree with me Lindsay and why why do you think it's it's important for professionals to be attending dissections on a regular basis no I think it's really critical because for I, I think for them to if you've never attended a dissection it's such a mind blowing experience. And I suppose for professionals, if you're veterinarians, you, you may have attended some dissections in veterinary college, but to carry on, I think it's really important because every horse is different. And what mm. you might have in vet, veterinary college, when you come out and you do another one in the field and you see different things, it just builds on that knowledge. And mm. I'm sure it helps people to like you said and i truly believe that they're not naughty because they're naughty mm -hmm. i honestly feel in my in my heart that there's a reason and every single horse that, that's been euthanized and donated to me i have found really really good reasons as to why it was good that they were euthanized mm -hmm. and real wake-up calls as well now, mm -hmm. a lot of these horses that have come to me, the vets couldn't tell what was wrong with them. With all mm -hmm. of the all of the, the nerve blocks or the x-rays or whatever they did, they couldn't come up with a true diagnosis. And I think by coming to a whole horse dissection, what it then does is it then starts, you see things, instead of from the horse point of view while it's alive and mm -hmm. all your tests you do that you would normally do to rule out or whatever you might look at it in a different way and you might just remember one that you did with Lindsay Field where you found there was a horse that had a three-year-old horse with kissing spines and this guy he's three years old yeah. and you would not have believed that by looking at him that he had this now, when I say kissing spines, what it is is these spinous processes are mm. actually opening on each other. I don't know if, if, if you can see it sort of up here. You know, they shouldn't even be touching, and, and they are, and they're actually wearing into it. Sorry, I'm not in the right place, wearing into mm. each other. Mm. Now, you can see how young this guy is, because can you see this little line through here? Oh, that his oh. He's a, he was a baby 
And yeah. show you this one here. So it looks a bit looks a bit yuck because it's got this piece here because mm. this is where the would be for the growth plate. And mm. this is the bit that comes off here. I call it Mickey the Mickey Mouse. And so that goes cool. on there like that. And so that's how they mm. grow because you know this cartilage that then turns to bone. This mm. guy was three and he had kissing spines and he was very unhappy nobody picked it up nobody but nobody picked it up and then the question will be is okay so if we did pick it up what can we do about it and what does the yeah. owner want yeah. so i think that i would love veterinarians to be more involved and and come to the table with me mm. and learn with me and um, mm. That they would get a really good experience and be able to take mm -hmm. that away and see things differently from the inside mm -hmm. rather than when it's alive and looking at what, what the textbooks, what you have to do with the textbook uh, protocols in, in finding or ruling out mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I, I think some other things that stand out for me in attending whole horse dissections is that it, like you say, every horse is different, but also every group of people that are there is different. And the knowledge shared and the kind of the 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 different perspectives that come together creates new realizations and and new epiphanies that you would you wouldn't have any other way. There's no other way that you would have that moment where this owner's experience plus this body worker's you know, um, observation plus your experience come together and create this moment of realization or understanding. And that's really powerful. And I think it, it not only strengthens our knowledge or it improves our knowledge, but it strengthens those relationships that we have with other professionals. And that's, that's important because if you're, if you're attending whole horse dissections in your area, in your region, then hopefully you're doing it with professionals that are in your region and then yeah. those are the people that you need to be connecting with on a on a professional level so multidisciplinary team stuff thrown in there <laughs> yeah Probably. i really think, you yeah. know the thing it's not just well, as you say it's not just the dissection it's not just that horse on the table and what we're about a lot of the conversations are gold that we have mm. and every I do every time I do a dissection I teach but I also learn as well and I learn mm -hmm. so much from the horse that's given me all his secrets and the people mm -hmm. around me and you know when you when you see something and you look at it from your own point of view and you can't think of any other point of view because you were looking at it the way it is and then another group of people will say oh yeah but I wonder if it could be that or that and you go oh yeah and it just brings that conversation to the table mm -hmm. and it also means that you're not stuck in your own way of thinking which can be really dangerous if you do that mm -hmm. you know you I really feel that if you really want to learn something and, and be good at it and excel in it you have to listen to people and take it on and sift it and make mm -hmm. and make sure it, you know is it's it's true and correct and valid and verified, mm -hmm. and then go with it. You know, I, mm -hmm. I never miss anything. Sometimes I hear the most bonkers mm -hmm. things. I have to sometimes go. <laughs> so then I think, okay, let's just think about this and think whether coming through. And then the other thing is, is that I would also, if there was something really crazy coming to the table in a dissection that someone would say, I would never say that they were crazy. <laughs> Even though I might think, mm, not very good. I, and then I'll say, okay, explain what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, oh, look, this has happened and it must be because of that. And I go, but why must it be? Oh, mm -hmm. because of the saddle has caused the adhesions there. And I go, okay, so you make an assumption that the saddle has caused that. Yep, that's that's adhesions because of the saddle. You know, that's where the saddle is, is, is crushed in a certain area or whatever. And then I'll say, what if I told you this horse had never had a saddle on his back? And I go, oh, okay. 
I said, well, he hasn't never had a saddle on his back. What could have caused it? Think, think about what could have caused it. And they go, oh, okay. I said, so maybe he was bitten. Maybe another horse bit mm -hmm. him on the back at that place where the saddle was, where he could have had a saddle issue. You know, you've always got to think outside the square. You mustn't jump to conclusions. Mm -hmm. Yes, as I'd say, okay, so we've seen it in this horse. We have to see it again and again and again in order to really see patterns and that get enough mm -hmm. numbers in order to say, okay, there could be a correlation here. Ne and I try and always say, never use the word never or always or <laughs> always never. <laughs> I always try and say, oh, I shouldn't even say always, should I? I try to say, I've not seen this before. It could be this. But I always need, I need more, I need to investigate it more and I need to see it more before I can really feel that it's, it's true and, uh, and verifiable really. Mm. Yeah. Because it, it really is, every horse you see is an N of one. So you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you, because how are you not necessarily comparing, you know, um, 20 racehorses to each other, you're looking at, retirees wow. and youngsters and this yeah. and this and this and you can't compare them to each other no. in of one <laughs> no cannot and i i think really this is the hardest thing for me when i'm working with non-professionals and because they will they will jump to a conclusion and maybe it might be an, an you know an ulterior motive or something they believe in desperately and they want it to fit their agenda. But I'll always step back and say, but you know, let, let's, let's unpick this and let's let's try and work it through. Because I think we could, I think we could be, we could be going up the wrong, the wrong alley here. Can I show you some more bones? I, I would love that. I was gonna say, so you've really developed some really good <laughs> communication skills as well. Um, Lindsay, please share with us like some of the things that you've some of the interesting right. share some bones with us please show us <laughs> all right so i already i already showed you the one of the the youngster and this is from an older horse so you can see so these are the thoracic vertebrae and you know they're thoracic because you can see where the ribs would be all right so that tells you what area you're in and this is probably about um t14 thoracic to t18 and we know that they've got 18 of these so we sort of you know we could be getting down the end so let's have a look even though this was an older horse even in this case we Lindsay, still I'm, yes? I'm going to take myself off of the screen so okay. that um, everyone can see the bones more clearly and All then right. when you stop talking I'll pop myself back All on right. not going anywhere but I just want everyone to be able to kind of have the best yeah. view of the of the bones okay good all right so this one here although he's a bit older can you see he's still got this little line through here so this is like the remnant of where the growth plate would be but this guy was nine years old so it's, it's interesting isn't it? It, it that you would look at this on its own and you'd say mm, i reckon he could be five or six but he wasn't so Again, that's another thoracic vertebrae. Thoracic because we know he's got the rib part. But I want to show you this. So this let's just assume this is the last one before we get to the lumbar vertebrae, the ones at the back. And I just want to show you this. <laughs> this which way round? This one. Yeah, look at look at this. And what we're actually seeing, can you see these bits here? These are ribs and they shouldn't be there. This should look like this. It, it's, it should have separate ribs. So basically it's got really confused when it was being formed and it doesn't know, and it's genetics, it doesn't know whether it should be a thoracic or a lumbar because the lumbar vertebrae have these bits coming out like this, these processes, transverse processes they're called. So this is a, a really good example of a, a, mal, 
a malformation and can you imagine what that would have done with the horse if, if, if while he was alive because we know that every bone has got musculature associated with it and and attachments so my question would be is the poor horse you know what what would this have been like for him yeah. and it's i mean those moss ribs are are more mobile than the ones before because they're not attached directly to the sternum so there should be more more movement happening there and more ability like that would affect the breathing and the diaphragm and yeah probably the nervous system as well exactly so and then so what was what was this horse experiencing what was the owner kind of experiencing and observing yeah. in life this one thoroughbred he was mm -hmm. 18 he'd never been raced and he would buck and rear at a gate change so from trot to canter he'd throw a wobbly once you got him into the canter, he was okay but he couldn't sustain it then your breath dropped down to a trot and he'd throw another wobbly and it became really dangerous and then when i opened him up this is what i found <laughs> was it just the, was that just the last rib that was fused or yeah. were there fumes? yeah yeah okay. it's bt18 that's so, so interesting you, I know, it, and, and there is a remnant i don't know if it is a remnant or if it's just a little bit of bony outgrowth of where the rib might have been. I know it's bizarre. And then this one here, it's just got one. So we've got this here on this side, just like I showed you. But on this side, we have the gaps ready for the rib. We have the joint. So I mean, that's, that's incredible. And uh, you, get, I so you get these, but, but this is the, even though this is N of one, this is one horse, it makes you realize that this is out there. It's not just one horse that has this. There will be other horses that have this. And how do we recognize that? And how do we work with that? It completely changes the picture. It's like, okay, well, I want to perform rib mobilizations. And I'm performing them on a rib that is fused to the spine. Then I'm not mobilizing the rib. I'm mobilizing those facet joints. And what what difference does that make? That's just yeah. And and those are not the only malformations, right? There are malformations in the transverse processes of the lumbar area as well, which which are also really significant. Yeah, yeah. And then we've got the cervical. You know the um, the transformations. Uh, but then you know the question. Is there's not enough? In, I don't think there's enough. In, well, there might be, but I've not seen enough information that categorically correlates performance or movement with these issues. I don't think we've done those specific studies because, first of all, you'd have to be looking for this, wouldn't you? You know, this if you wanted to correlate that to some issue within the horse, and how many people will have done that? I know Sharon May Davis has done a lot of work on the C6, C7. Mm. Um, they don't, they don't, they call, what's it called? The vertebrate, they don't call it uh, complex. M. But I've, I've seen different names for the abbreviation and now I'm like, now I'm, yeah. now I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose my question really now is that, okay, if we see things that are like that, so they obviously are not right, mm. but what, it actually mean to the horse and it's all very well me saying and what the owner said about this guy was the transitions but how do we really know that it was that that caused the problem we don't we don't, don't. We, can, we, can't, we can't know that until we've had 20 horses that have exactly that same problem with exactly the same yeah exactly and the thing is is they all behave so differently and we know that they're you know their pain their pain responses are so different as well and that like sue dyson did though that you know, was it the 20 signs of pain which are mm. so subtle, really really subtle and some horses to show things and some won't right. it's really to know isn't it i've got another, yeah. another lovely thing to show you if you've got time yeah yeah we have time all right so these this is the 
the lumbar side. This is the lumbar, all right? Now, it doesn't look very correct because what happened was, is I said to my friend when he put his horse down and he wanted to keep the meat, I said, can I have the spine? He said, yeah, that's fine. I'll save it for you. Well, he did save it for me after he'd given it to his dogs in the kennel and after they'd gnawed all these spinous processes off and transverse processes, I was heartbroken. Anyway, I had to thank him very much, but I still got something out of it because even though we've lost a lot of information, which doesn't really matter, this is what I found underneath. So this is the top and this is the underneath. And look at this. Look at these big lumps here. And these are huge, great chunks of bone there. And the whole thing is rigid. It, they don't even come apart. And it's almost as if the whole, it's like it's fused together to try and stabilize itself. That's what I was thinking. You know, I could be wrong and this could be something completely different, but I thought, my goodness, imagine having that <laughs> in your, in your lumbar area. Not very nice, eh? Sure, that's that's incredible. That's incredible. And, and very sad that he um, gave that to his dogs. Yeah. <laughs> but, but so like he gave it to his dogs completely fused like that and you haven't I mean it's just fused it's completely fused and it doesn't you get they don't look like that you know they normally all come apart no. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah yeah I mean some of them are but I mean that was a really good example of something yeah. quite different and I'm seeing so many strange things that it blows <laughs> my mind I think yeah it I think we should also, you know, put on our glasses and say, well, this horse is euthanized for a reason. <laughs> so, you know, maybe not everyone looks like this, but but yeah. it, it really does confirm for me that mm -hmm. she, the work that Sue Dyson, I'm so glad you mentioned that because we need to start opening our eyes. Horses are willing, amazing creatures who want, who want to for some strange re reason, um, work with us and when there's resistance when there's behaviors that are abnormal there is a reason and we can't we can't just keep overlooking it um and as an owner I know I overlook them sometimes too yeah so I know that it's really hard hard because we especially when it's your own horse but we are there we are their advocates and we are their voices and we need to be the ones to speak up for them and to even if all we do is recognize something is not as it should be and yeah. just take the pressure off to perform and to reach your goals and to do all these things and try and help them find a better way of being and living um yeah. so we have some highs guys welcome Elsa, right. El Elsa's joining us from the paddock. <laughs> I love oh. that. I love that. Don't show your horses the pictures. This is sensitive content. No, okay. no, no. It's, don't, don't. It's great. The horses. <laughs> keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself and just bring the good stuff to your horses. Um, and if Dakar, it's so great to have you. Welcome. Um, yeah, guys, if you are joining us live, uh, let us know where you're from, like the horse paddock in Sweden. That's so cool. Um, I, I think this is a great way to just chill in the paddock and be with your horses. And if you are watching as a replay, hashtag replay in the comments, share your questions, share your thoughts, um, anything that you want to chat about, let us know. And uh, we can always get Lindsay back on. Um, yeah. <laughs> Or yeah. you can answer your questions in the comments. Hopefully she'll do that for us. Um, and we can join her Facebook page and learn from her there as well. So uh, I hope Beat Beatrice, is that how I say your name? That's that's not a spelling I'm familiar with. From Holland, it's so great to have you. Hi. Um, guys, you are slow. We're 44 minutes in and I'm only getting hellos now. <laughs> Share share your questions, please. Anything you want to know from us, let us know. Um, okay, so I think I oh, and Beatrix from South Africa and Claire from New Zealand. Yes, yes. Claire Eremonger. 
which oh, I might be saying yeah. wrong. <laughs> there we go. Uh, well, oh, Caroline from Ireland, oh, it's so lovely. great to have you. Let me, yep. Um, oh, Elsa, you didn't get any peace until now. Is that because your horses are mugging you for carrots? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, um, I think another what kind of links really great with our topic today. Yes, we have a question. Right. I do have a question. Statistically, how often do you find changes in horses that could potentially be attributed to poor performance? Great question. Great question. I can't answer it. <laughs> Hi from Latvia. <laughs> about it how often do i find changes in horses so do you mean at dissection that could be attributed to poor performance so we're seeing something on the dissection table and then we can then relate that to why they couldn't do a certain thing is that what you mean ants i think that is what she means yes so okay. so i think it comes down to that thing right there's a reason this horse is put down do you find the reason most always i've always mm. found a reason and you know the thing is the, the thing that i'm more worried about when i do this is that i'm not going to find an answer and look you mm. see i'm that so i'm not really i'm not allowed to diagnose but i can use my experience to say i've not seen this before or i have seen this before and i can i know my anatomy and so mm. i can I can use that. I can use my experience with that. And every time we have a horse in to dissect and I get a full history and I get a body worker in to do a full body work check, uh, we don't hurt them or anything. Very, very gentle. And they get a lovely massage and they get, they stay with me for about three days and they get a real good time. They get a beautiful mm -hmm. time. We have three days of lots of cuddles and scratches and, I just want to see that horse in a um, comfortable, lovely environment. And sometimes I've said to the owners, are you really sure you want to put this horse to sleep? I mean, that three-year-old with the kissing spines was one that I said to her, are you sure? And she said, yeah, I'm really sure because he's so unhappy. He's so miserable. She bought him because she wants to take him out of a bad situation and mm. she wanted to give him a chance she threw a lot of money at him body work vets everything and no one could really sort him out mm. and so miserable and so unhappy she kept him for about two years and she said in the end she said i can't do this to him anymore i can't mm. put him in winter and then we found all those problems and that was just one problem he had a lot more than, than what i've just shown you and every horse that I've had has shown that they've had some quite significant problems. Now, mm -hmm. when they're 28 years old, you expect to see things, you know, you expect to see some of the joints to be worn and some of the cartilage off. And some of them have got amazing joints. And you think that is incredible. You know, you mm -hmm. open up the joint and, and the joint fluid is beautiful. It's nice and thick. It's not blood stained. It's great. And others, you'll open up the joint and it's it's blood stained in there and then you'll look at the joints you know the actual cartilage between the two bones and it's it's like bone on bone and you think well how on earth could they even walk like it so what i want to say is that 100 percent now and i've done 23 23 dissections 100 percent of them so n equals 23 I have been so glad that they made that call to put them to sleep. Really, really glad. And I think that's my biggest nightmare, really, is if someone really thinks there's something wrong with their horse and convinced. And it's really a horrible time to make that call. And then they want answers because they don't just want to bury them in the ground. And there's no, they're not using that, that horse to educate or to help other people. People in New Zealand have been brilliant. They really want to educate others. And yeah, my biggest worry is that I'm not going to find anything, but I always have. 
And then the next question will be is, well, does that, what I'm seeing, is that enough to put them to sleep? But I'm seeing some serious stuff in their joints. I'm seeing some, I don't like to use the word inflammation, but I can see redness. I can see swelling. I can see little pop, pop marks of like little bruising everywhere. You know, there's something going on that, and, and I'll see that in one horse. In another horse, it'll be squeaky clean. Yeah. And build up this picture. And sometimes it's not all just bone stuff. It can be soft tissue. Um, one horse we did had ulcers in his hind gut, which was a surprise. Didn't expect to see that. And yet his stomach was squeaky clean. Not a single ulcer in there. But in the hind gut, it was full of these lots and lots of little ulcers all the way through. But he had other, I, other problems, lots of problems as well. Yeah, you know, I I'd love to just add another thought in that if we're seeing these dramatic changes to the bones and the joints, um, what has already happened in the muscular in the muscles in the soft tissue because because that's a chicken or egg scenario, right? It may have been, the joint might be primary or it may be, it may be the result of a dysfunction in that muscular, in that muscular system or the nervous system or the fascial system, whatever that's been going on for a really long time and has yeah. resulted in changes within the bones and the joints. And that's, 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 it's, it's heartbreaking to think, to think about that. It really is. Um, Elsa has a has a yeah a comment. I wish we had time to do this with my fifty three year old. She was so active and content un until she got colic. I'd love yeah. to see if what we thought was a fit and happy horse truly was inside. Elsa, did you did you you know was that a typo fifty three year old horse? <laughs> That's yeah wow. Oh, I'd love to have looked inside your fifty three year old. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, and she says that's fascinating that the hindgut and the stomach can be so different. Totally, yeah. it's totally different processes because the stomach is mm -hmm. like a holding process and it mm -hmm. starts the digestive process, whereas the mm -hmm. hind is a completely different process, it's fermentation and it's all the microbes in there that are breaking down the plant uh, material that the uh, the the foregut can't and mm. so it i mean it is incredible really it's so fascinating and um you don't like the gut but i do <laughs> i love the gut it's my most favorite thing <laughs> um elsa says she did her own stretches every morning i love that um you knew also have you watched the webinar series in the in the equine membership with um tulia Luamala? Because she talks about um, horses, you know, we all stretch ourselves, yawning. Yeah. It's all a part of it. And yeah. there's a word for it. And now the word is gone from my oh. mind. And I love that word when I, but it's something with a P. Wow. I'm going to try to remember. And then I'll put it in the comments. <laughs> but yeah. if you, have you watched those webinars? Because they're, they're so good. They're so good. Oh, look, I um, am. I'm time poor and I have to really pick what I'm, what I'm trying to learn because, and I have to really niche it because there is mm. so much really to learn. And I want to know as much as I can about each little bit. And mm. you, your, your um, El, was it Elsa that's saying about her 53 year old, what would you find inside? I think also we have to put into context that we might be finding things, but they actually might not be significant. So, like, mm -hmm. if you have people, 100 fit, active, 25-year-old men, and you put them all through an MRI scanner, what would you find? Well, you could find a heck of a lot. Does it mean anything? Just because we see it, does it mean anything? And so this is why we have to be really careful when we see something, not to jump to all these lovely conclusions that we want to and look i i do it and i have to rein myself back and say look you know you don't know that n equals you know n of one like you said when we say n of one it means n means a sample which means we've got one in our sample and i'm always saying 
We've only got one in our sample. We really need, we might need a hundred to actually get an answer. So I, I try and be as open-minded and critical thinking as I can. And that's the way I've been brought up as a scientist to have a critical thinking mind. But I can't help but keep jumping to conclusions, <laughs> especially when I see horrible things like, <laughs> you know, like this, yeah. these riding each other. <laughs> that must hurt. No, I, exactly. El Elsa says, yes, I have raging arthritis since I was eight, but I still do this job okay and in tolerable discomfort. <laughs> Sure. Um, and, and, and that's very important. And the re I mean, the research supports that when we look at um, x-rays and diagnostics, that the, the clinical signs don't always correlate to radiographic findings. Um, and it will be the same thing here. That, yeah, it, yeah it, it, just because we find something in the horse, is that clinically relevant? And I think it's fair to say if we're dissecting a horse, it is likely that it was clinically relevant to that horse because that because that horse was likely showing behavioral changes yeah. that 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 meant that it wasn't coping. Um, yeah. yeah, but does it mean that another horse with exactly the same thing exactly. might not be coping? They might be coping perfectly. So it, we can't yeah, that that is that is the problem, is that it just we can't draw a blanket line. We're all individuals. Um, Elsa is 57. That's a long time with arthritis, and she's and she's coping. She's functional. She's living life. Um, she's doing her job. That's incredible. And maybe if I had that level of arthritis, I I don't know. It, exactly. Yeah, maybe I would be. So that's that's the thing. I'm I'm gonna cut us off because we've we've we're hitting an hour. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. We're hitting an hour. So guys, if you want Lindsay back to chat with us again, let, let us know. And, um, and maybe she'll be willing to do that and share more stories with us and we can continue this conversation. Um, I hope that it's a conversation that we can, that we can continue having regularly just about dissections, about learning about the individual horse. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, and it ties in so beautifully with the Vet Rehab Summit this year. So if you are not yet aware of our Vet Rehab Summit, um, we hold an annual conference in November. This year, it's a two-day event on the 10th and the 11th. It will be a live event. You guys need to be there because the recordings will only be available for a very short space of time um, and we're talking about myofascial chains and we're very blessed to have Vibka Albrandt and Rika Skultz as our lecturers. And they'll be lecturing on both the equine and the canine uh, myofascial chains for two days. So put that in your diaries and please, please be there because equine, not canine practitioners, we don't know anything about this yet. We need to hop on board. We need to catch up because the equine people are way ahead of us. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. So um, loads of comments and thank yous. Uh, and everyone would love to hear more and have you back again. And maybe some training too. Yeah, I like some more foot stuff, really, because that's my expertise. You know, I've been that's my foot for six years now and I'm, I'm working with Professor Pollitt who is a very well-known anatomist of the equine foot and discovered one of the causes of laminitis and that's what I'd really love to do with you guys and show you a foot and see if I could twist the camera around so I could do I could show it to you because at the moment it'd be a bit difficult holding it up like this so we have to sort out I'd love to and then you can get folks asking questions and then we can go down lots of different rabbit holes but that would be my that's my real thing <laughs> we would love i would we would love to do that let's we'll organize that for you guys um if you're watching the recording hashtag replay share where you're from join the conversation we want to hear from you guys bye everyone thank you bye